Hey friends, how are you? It's Mr. McKinney here with Mr. McKinney's Store in Houston with Manette Basil, the board president for the Heritage Society. We are so excited to be here today to be able to talk about a place that we really love and adore, the 1868 San Felipe Cottage. Say hello, Manette. Hi, and welcome everybody to Sam Houston Park, Houston's first municipal park, 1899. And welcome to the Heritage Society, the first preservation conservation organization in Houston, started in 1954. We manage 10 historic buildings and some others with programs, projects, and we invite you to come and see us on Facebook and Instagram and visit us when you can. Absolutely, and you know what? We're talking about the Houston Census, sorry, the Harris County Census and, and the U.S. Census. It's so important. Talk a little about the census and why people should fill it out and the deadline coming up. Well, there's multiple reasons. Number one, the city of Houston gets millions of dollars in federal monies by taking their census and getting the numbers up. So these are things that will help our city be better. Secondly, historians love to use the census for research, looking at how many people lived in a household, what they did for a living, uh, where they came from, their ages, and censuses are huge, huge resources for historians doing research about our past. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. Manette Basil, board president for the Heritage Society. Thank you so much for joining us and for being well, a part of today. Thank you, Mr. McKinney, for doing these wonderful shows for us. Well, I love it. Thank you again. Take care. Let's take you inside the house now, by the way, and meet Allison Bell, the executive director for the Heritage Society, and learn about the house itself, by the way, the 1868 San Felipe Cottage, one of the 10 historic structures we have here at the Heritage Society, which, as you heard, Manette Basil, goes back to 1954, when a bunch of concerned citizens got together to save Houston's history. Well, here we go. Look at Hello. this. Oh my gosh, it's Allison Bell, the executive Hello, director. Mr. McKinney, welcome back. Well, come on come in. Come on in, everyone. Thank well, you. Welcome to the San Felipe Cottage. Look at this. Built in 1868. You and look at this, in. Isaac, right over here. Check this out. That's what I want to show. This is, of course, Here's Joseph Meyer. Yeah. So really come here, Allison Bell, and tell us about this great house. Oh, this take us house. take us on a journey of basically what the house used to be like sure. and how we got it here at the Heritage Society. Yes, so this house was located over on West Dallas, 313 West Dallas, built, as we said, in 1868, built by German um, immigrants and occupied by German immigrants. This is where it was when it was over on West Dallas, uh, near San Felipe, what used to be yeah. San Felipe Street. The old San Felipe Trail. Now West Dallas. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and what historic, or not so much historic, well, it is 1972, so I guess it is somewhat historic. The old Meridian Hotel, which later becomes Doubletree, and yes. now it's called the C. Baldwin after yeah. Charlotte Baldwin Allen. I love it. And then this is what it looked like when it arrived. Um, we had to tear it up, uh, you know, in half again. As, and this is interesting. I thought that this is what you mentioned. They said that it was built in 1837, but they did some more research and realized that it really was built in 1868. And then I want to show you how it finally You know, and that jumps back to the wonderful, uh, you know, uh, ask that our board president did about the census because we use census right, records right. to determine who lived in the house, who was at that actual address. So that's how we find out about things like the actual time period for a house. Which is why it's so important for Absolutely, everyone Absolutely, 100%. Yes. September yes. 30th, by the way, is the deadline to be counted. So you've heard our Harris County judge, you've heard our mayor, Houston Mayor Turner, talk about the importance, Margaret Wallace, Brown and Planning, all that mm -hmm. stuff matters. So go out there and fill your census. And this is its final resting place. Here it is, and, um, and I don't know if some of you are familiar with, but there's the McKinney Bridge. So it is still here. It's been here since 1962. It came to the Heritage Society in 1962. Yes, yeah, so I want to take you through the house. Let's do it. Let's check out the house. Okay, as I said, um, German, a heavy, heavy German influence. Um, Texas was very, um, wanted immigrants here. So they, they uh, encouraged immigrants to come to, to Texas. So we've got, this room is known as the parlor. And this is where they would have their finest things it, because they, they would welcome their, their guests into the parlor. And this would, this would show you how much money this family had by the things that they sh um, exhibited in the house. I want you to come over and see a close up of these wonderful German instruments. This is semi like a, an accordion and this is like a small piano. And these were obviously very popular in this room because they welcomed people. They sat in their rocking chairs, they played music, and then over here, they showed off some of their finer things. This, of course, is in German. Um, and a lot of beautiful um, ceramics that they brought, that they handmade and brought over. This is another piano, a real piano, <laughs> with the foot pedal at the back. 
This was made by German immigrants. There was a heavy influence of the German immigrants in um, around Brenham. Well, and you can see the wood detailing, and, yes. by the way, not just on the outside of the house we saw on the way in here, but also inside. So a lot of love and attention was played when it comes Absolutely. to things like that. I love that. Well, yes, let's keep and then let's going. keep oh, moving. Wait, check out this, though. Oh. So it, it, you don't often need this in Houston, but sometimes it does get cold, a little cold snaps. <laughs> but look at this. Not anymore, but yes, it does. And that's so the little wood stove pipe. And then um, when we're coming into the dining room, fireplace and this is where they kept their fine china so you'll see the china cabinet and they uh, we uh, have this wonderful cabinet over here of beer steins german beer steins which i know george slaughter loves and hopefully he'll y'all talk about that when he comes on the show but he got a big kick out of all those um german beer steins we did have to move the dining room for the show but this is normally the uh, the regular dining room Look i might need a little stove. light in yes here. let's check this out get that light going isaac real quick there we go and let's check out look at this this is called the work room so between the kitchen and the uh this is the kitchen in between the dining room this was called the workroom and this is where they did their laundry and look let me just show you these cute little oh look at pins. the old-fashioned wood clothespins old wood some clothes of us pins, out yes. there you're out there watching now you remember these clothespins yes and so they did a lot of um the laundry and the workroom was in between because their kitchen was not uh, their stove they wanted to be closer to the stove to dry some of the laundry so it's a little hard to see in here but this and we're going to see that typically sometimes you'll have the kitchen detached yeah. from the actual house for safety reasons and then of course the kitchen which uh, we mentioned with the um the fireplace and this is a pie safe which is where they apparently they baked a lot of pies oh, and had them in a pie safe. pie safe and so, speaking of pies look at this delicious look at this. dessert <laughs> look at that and i mentioned this earlier we had our wonderful joanne zumbrum come and show us about the set i house i talked yes. about the lovely fake food, food and food that's just by there Henry Gabbard. yeah by henry gabbard just these things that are iconic Creative. yes and yes. really make these houses and this is a museum by the way it's a Absolutely. house museum all and, of our houses are houses and they're great yeah. teaching tools for young kids to be able to be wowed by the experience that's of how right. people lived in and yesteryear and i hope i'll talk about that when we sit down because we're bringing back tours and i'm Ooh, very excited we'll, we'll definitely that. discuss that in your executive yeah. director well let's let's keep yeah, going then follow us going. let's do it follow us this way show on the road and we'll sit down and talk about what's happening at the heritage society wonderful well here we go Okay. Just set all this up as we normally do, and we'll get going. Well, thank you again so much for tuning in to another episode of Live from the Heritage Society with Mr. McKinney. I'm so happy to be able to have our wonderful executive director, Allison Bell, join us. Of course, George Slaughter is going to be joining us later on in the show, so we're super excited to be able to have him because you're going to learn about Spring Branch history from the one and only, okay? Isaac, turn that light off real quick, okay? Uh, by the way, we also want to make sure that we thank our wonderful board president, okay? Board President Manette Basil, she was with us earlier, our awesome board chair, and I put a little beret on there. She didn't have one today, but she <laughs> loves her iconic beret. And if you're not familiar with Manette, she is what I consider kind of the, the grand dame of preservation yes. here in Houston back Very in the passionate. 80s. Yes, she and a bunch of folks, Guy Hagstead, Randy Pace, all these youngsters are out there saving these historical buildings in market square we would not have market square if it wasn't for folks like manette so right. bless her and, and and to be a volunteer with our board is wonderful we're so lucky to be able Which to have a full -time her full-time job with no pay it's become a full-time <laughs> job with no pay and like i said we're absolutely blessed to be able to have her join us well thank you again allison bell is with us today again the executive director and there she is with oh uh gosh. remember that you find all these pictures every week you surprise me with well, what you well and that's that's Isn't not that cute well that's jim for our past yes. board president yes. he looks like the monopoly guy in this photo <laughs> you know with his top hat on and his mustache his beautiful wife uh, joe beautiful wife joe who's always in, in the social publications with her amazing outfits that she has but real quick tell us about a change in what's happening yes. with telling houston's stories absolutely so We'd mentioned pre uh, previously that our luncheon is still on Tuesday, September 15th, but however, we made the difficult decision to uh, go virtual, and so we are going to still have our luncheon, but it will be virtually done, and J.P. Bryan will still be our speaker. He's going to be live from Colorado Springs. He's going to stay in his home in Colorado, and we have a wonderful uh, company that we're working with to bring him live so you can still ask questions and answers at the end of his talk um, we will still be honoring of course harriet and truett as i mentioned and dancy and jim will still be um, partaking as our co-chairs so we're excited about it you know what it we put on a live auction we just launched it on sunday and i brought a few things that we're auctioning off but you I believe you're going to show the link or where you can go to our website and yes. get the link of the um, 
uh, to get onto the silent auction, but we're auctioning off gift certificates, crystal, a couple of pieces of antiques that were in our pop-up sale. Look, we have some a gift certificate from the Lancaster Hotel. You can catch the symphony across the street. I heard that they might be coming back. Uh, the mayor made an announcement today that maybe some events are coming back. But um, so we are excited about some of the different items. Um, oh, guess who's going to have his bus tour available? You can buy a certificate, take all your friends. I just went on, on the bus a couple of weeks ago. It's a blast. It's cooler uh, weather, so you can take ten, nine of your friends and uh, for social distancing. We've got some wonderful gift certificates from the Heights, uh, hair salons, and I think we have some jewelry. Oh, and this is a beautiful Antique piece. Antique furniture. Yes, this piece was in the Stati house. It is a sideboard complete with the mirror, drawers, and storage, lots of storage underneath. And it is, it is beautiful. And we would love for somebody who loves and cherishes antiques. This is where we will be having our, this is the ballroom on the bayou and it's uh, our, our own Kirksey Gregg. Uh, runs it and we will be here social distancing for the program however not all the luncheon participants will be but there but he's also got some gift certificate items right has he and, donated and some and items yes, for the auction because these are all some always, really yes. great items that you need to go to the heritage society's website yes. our actual website heritage.org you go there and there's a tab you click on the live auction and you can bid on some of these items yeah. Actually, it's, a, it's a virtual silent auction is what it is yes but really this is a way to support the heritage Society. we've also got some That's packages some spas, from yes. some spas that are happening here in houston so easy way to support what we do at the hair side by simply getting an item bidding on an item so don't miss out please make sure that you do that okay right. all right speaking of an event that's happening also a continuous yes. event that's going on talk about this yes. event okay so our women's exhibit as you know we started uh, around july quietly and realized not many people were coming downtown of course so we put all of our suffrage online suffrage merchandise online so you can still purchase that the exhibit, we are still open Wednesday through Friday. You can come downtown. It's socially distancing. Um, it's safe, um, quiet, and you can see the tour yourself, or you can go online virtually and see the tour as well. Um, but I want to say that we just had a realtor last week who purchased a tour for her office associates, came down, and Sloan did the private I tour. Love that. It was in the evening. They had wine and snacks afterwards, and... Um, got to see one-on-one -on -one with our co-curator. to So you can take a private tour with uh, Ann Sloan, um, or you can take a private tour on your own. We will just make sure that the museum's closed, but take advantage of that because that will only be up until next March. And it's an absolute treat. Many of y'all probably saw Ann Sloan on August 12th through her amazing talk all about this exhibit. Well, guess what? If you missed the talk, you can go to YouTube and check it out. But also, too, you can actually take virtual tours of the hair tech for five dollars which is a steal because it is a visual treat you actually can walk through and it's so detailed you can read you can actually read with a fine 12 point what the exhibit says so you get a great deal for five dollars and of course the money goes to the hair decided which is what you normally would be paying to if check out the it. exhibit right. so please consider doing that and helping us out hey talk about a rental opportunity oh, sure. because the weather's getting nice now yeah. And people don't realize the Heritage Society is a major asset when it comes. And we just heard the mayor earlier today talk gonna, about, yeah. yeah, at the press conference, what that they're going to start doing programs and events in outdoor public spaces, oh. safely distanced. And so you'll be hearing about that. The Houston Symphony, for example, is, and they're going to be opening up some of their venues. So you'll be seeing some of the venues coming up as well. Okay. Do that. But a venue that is probably better than any is here in downtown Houston with awesome free parking. Talk yes. about the venue they should be renting. Oh my gosh. So this is the beautiful Connolly Plaza. And this tree is called Jane Ellen's Tree. And I have had three proposals and two weddings just in the last year under this beautiful tree, especially due to COVID. People want to be outside. And it's over 100 years old and it is gorgeous. The ground, the limbs touch the ground. Then you've got this beautiful brick plaza that is also rentable. This is our tea room, um, which is another rental space. And then of course our most famous rental facility is our 1891 St. John Church. Um, I have a lot of brides. Look at that beautiful planter. I wonder what Well, the plaza is. itself, is there's a lot of space out there. You can really distance people out and Absolutely. have a really nice event. 50 people, 100 people, it holds 300 people normally. Mm -hmm. So we're doing 25% capacity. So if you look at about 75 to 50 people, that's an experience. And we're talking about when the weather gets cooler here in Houston, which is coming up 
real soon. So we're lucky yeah. to be able to have this. And that front space front is also space. available yes. too. People don't think about that. That's Long Row, by the way. That's a replica of the earliest commercial development that we had here back in the 1830s. So right. pretty exciting. And this is one of my favorites. This is behind the Stat Eye House. And when the Stat Eyes, you may have watched our show a couple of months ago with Jillian Zimmer in the Stat Eye House. The Stat Eyes, when they lived on Westmoreland, had a beautiful garden. And so we recreated it when we moved the house here. Um, and this is a uh, armillary, the old way that they tell time with the sun. And look at all these, the Parks Department does an excellent job of taking care of all of these plants back here. Um, and that's the Yates House, but that's another facility you can win. Oh, it's time for prizes. It is time for Allison, one of your favorite parks shopping. right here. Here we go, it's time for some prizes. Yes. So let's do it real quick. Okay, so there's people last week, Daniel Monsanto. If you watch to the very end, Daniel Monsanto, there he is. If you watch to the Postcard end, man. yes, then you can win some prizes because you probably paid attention. So let's talk about the winners. And we talked about early Houston postcards, by the way. Early Houston postcards here, uh, which what he specialized in, his book all about Houston postcards, uh, which you can get available on Amazon. It's an absolute treat. So Allison, tell us about our very first question. Okay, what city was Colt Stadium moved to? Um, Colt, so this is on the home, this is the home of the Colt 45s, and what city was it moved to? And the answer <laughs> is Tampico, That's Mexico. right. And Lloyd Smith was our winner. Lloyd Smith, you're one of the winners. So Lloyd Smith, we're going to reach out to you, but just know that you got that first one right, and you're one of the winners. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, how many floors did the original Union Station have upon first completion in 1911 based on the windows based on the windows at Union Station let's see here's the answer, answer. there's the old 1911 Union Station oh, wow. one window bay two three the answer is three, three floors. floors and, and the, the winner? winner oh Rebecca DeMarc how about Rebecca that DeMarc okay yes that's Look exciting that. yes and then uh, the next question, what was the name of the hotel motel pictured on South Main with the Astrodome in the background? The hotel motel pictured on South Main. And the answer, oh, the Crestwood. I remember the Crestwood. And the winner uh, is? Rebecca DeMarc again. Hey. Go, Rebecca. She's paying attention, Getting by the way. a couple of presents She's in the mail. She's watching our show and she's <laughs> racking up those prizes. So thank way you so go. much, Rebecca, for doing that. Okay, another question. What was the name of the building on the campus of the University of Houston seen in the live stream? The name of the building. And the answer? Agnes Arnold Hall. The winner, Bill Brimmer. There you go. Bill right. Brimmer's our winner. All right. Okay, last question. Here we go. And then what was the street pictured on the view of the very first postcard that was shown on screen? Here we go. And that's a clue, by the way. I typically try to give you a little bit of a clue. Hopefully you're paying attention to the show, but that's one clue. The answer is... Congress. Oh, Congress Street. Yes, of course. The winner, Lloyd Smith again. You see, we've got some repeat. Stay, if you stay tuned, you can win some prizes. They yes. were there to the end. So Lloyd Smith, another one of our winners over here. Thank you. Won two prizes. So to Rebecca. So you, uh, Allison Bell and her team will get in touch with you about the prizes. Uh, so we'll send you a message, by the way, but make sure that you know if you won, you'll be getting a call from us. Well, thank you again so thank much, you. Allison Bell, for joining us. We do appreciate it once again. Executive Director for the Heritage Society, Allison Bell, thank you again. Thank you again. We'll keep in touch. Okay. okay, there we go. Now, before we get ready for George Slaughter, I want to once again, we're going to be, of course, we're inside the 1868 San Felipe Cottage, but I want to basically thank once again, thank once again, our guy over there, uh, the guy that we know. Hold on a second, George. Okay. George, uh, Greg Kirksey, sorry, Greg Kirksey, uh, because uh, he was so kind to be able to offer the studio that you see over there. So once again, that studio is courtesy of George, of Greg Kirksey, okay? Greg Kirksey did that for us, our board member, and we're going to be back in our studio. Uh, we're definitely going to be back in our studio. So, uh, so we'll be there soon for our next guest that we have, which once again is going to be on the 23rd of September. He is a gentleman you probably know. His name is, of course, uh, the one and only... Chris Varela. So there's no show the 16th of September. We bring back to you a show coming up on September 23rd with actually, sorry, Christopher Varela, who's going to talk about early radio. In fact, I'll show you his book. Here it is. Here's the book right there. Early radio, KPRC, Cotton Port and Rail Center. Christopher Varela is going to be on the show, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. But thank you to him. And once again, thank you to Kirksey Greg for providing that for us. 
Also, she's back. You know I'm talking about the one and only Kimber Fountain. There's her book. Kimber Fountain is back on September 30th. So you do not want to miss out. Kimber Fountain back in studio joining us on September 30th. She's going to talk about the seawall itself. And we know, by the way, September 8th, and again, today's September 9th, people would have been waking up to a major disaster out in Galveston 120 years later, okay? And she's going to be talking about the 120th anniversary of the storm of 1900, okay? So do not miss out. Kimber Fountain, once again, September 30th. She's, by the way, offering a promo on her book. Kimber is offering a very special offer for us. Free shipping and a personal autograph on her book now until September 20th. So do not miss out. September 20th is when we're going to, when she's going to uh, end that promo. And the promo is simple. You just go onto her website. The promo code is Seawall120. Seawall120 gets you that free shipping and the autograph copy. You go to KimberFountain.Square.Site to be able to uh, get that free shipping okay so do not miss out and learn about galveston history in advance and by the way she's also offering that opportunity on the other books as well so red light district the maceo family you can get all three books at once for free shipping when you go to kimberfountain.square.net uh, and you do that by the way with her promo code seawall120 i mentioned earlier Christopher Rello is going to be joining us. He is the author of Radio, uh, I'm sorry, of Cotton Port and Rail Center, which is early Radio Houston history. Do not miss Christopher Varela. Uh, also, by the way, a big day. Here we have October 7th is a big day for us here, Johnny, because we have a homecoming. She's going to be back in, she's going to be joining us back here in Houston. Barry Scardino Bradley is going to be on the show October 7th. Do not miss out. Save the date now. October 7th. She's also going to, by the way, be doing another event with the Heritage Society in partnership on October 22nd. October 22nd, she's going to be working with AIA Houston and the Heritage Society to do another awesome talk about her book. That's going to be live and remote done uh, via video conference. We're going to have her actually in studio. So we're excited about that. Once again, Barry Scardino Bradley, do not miss out October 7th from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock live here at the Heritage Society with Mr. McKinney. Okay. And by the way, speaking of books, a brand new book just launched September 6th. That book is the one I'm talking about right over here. My buddy, my pal, Sandra Lord. She's going to be live in the studio October 14th with her brand new book, The Ghosts of Houston's Market Square Park. This book is detailed. This book is wonderful. You're going to learn about the history of all the surrounding blocks of Market Square with Sandra Lord, who's, by the way, celebrating her 80th birthday. She's proud about that because she's been doing this for four decades. She's been educating Houstonians about their amazing past, doing wonderful walking tours. So we're absolutely excited to be able to have Sandra Lord join us live in studio October 14th. Okay, so do not miss out. Once again, thank you to Daniel Monsanto. I know he's tuning in and watching us now. We really appreciate him being a part of this, uh, really taking us on this journey through Houston postcard history. Absolute pleasure. Uh, you know, really educating us. And he brought some really great cards, by the way. In fact, this card we love itself about the Rice Hotel, often never seen before. It talks about the early Rice Hotel back in 1913 when it was under construction, almost completed, because we all know it opens in 1913. But what's exciting is you see the banner for the Majestic Theater, which um, which is just down the street over there on Milam and, and, uh, and Texas Avenue between Travis. And there's a little construction warehouse out front blocking it. So you can tell it was freshly constructed. But there it is before, of course, the 1926 Alfred C. Finn design wing they add on later in 1926. So if you missed Daniel Monsanto's talk last week, never fear because YouTube has all these archived on YouTube. Go to our page, the Heritage Society's YouTube channel. Make sure you like and subscribe because we only have 216 subscribers and we need more people to like our YouTube page. And what you might not realize is if you have a, if you have a Gmail account, you actually have a YouTube account. So you can sign up right now to like our page on YouTube and be able to subscribe and get these great videos, including tonight's video with George Slaughter is going to be uploaded to YouTube later on this evening. So you'll be able to check it out tomorrow. So once again, like and subscribe to our page on YouTube.
I also want to make sure, lastly, that you like and follow Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Why do I ask you to do this? Because we offer free tours on board Houston's only open air bus, Houston's only mobile classroom. So make sure you go to social media and do that because we're going to be doing tours now in the fall for the public, working really closely uh, with an awesome friend to do a Sixth Ward tour, which is coming up. So that's an exclusive for you guys. Sixth Ward, early Sixth Ward history on board the Houston History Bus. But once again, you've got to like and follow our social media pages. Costs you nothing. Takes a couple seconds, and I promise you, you'll learn something new about Houston history. All right, we want to welcome right now the one and only George Slaughter. Come on down, as they say, George Slaughter. Hello, how are you? Doing great. How are you doing, Mr. McKinney? I am so excited to be able to have you on the show. Okay, excuse me real quick. Let's see. There we go. Okay, get those cameras on. There we go. Now we're live. Got to make sure everything's working, by the way. Got to make sure it's all working just fine. George Slaughter is going to talk about Spring Branch. So, like I said, we're excited to have you. Before we talk about Spring Branch history, we actually want you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I grew up here in the Houston area. My family moved to Spring Branch in 1972 from the Briar Grove area. And even then, it was considered way out in the middle of nowhere, uh, even though there was a lot of development out there. Of course, nowadays, Spring Branch is more towards the center of town if you look at a map of the city. Uh, I went to Springwoods High School in Houston, class of 83. My mother taught at uh, Northbrook High School for many years. My brother is also a Springwoods alum. And today I'm a freelance journalist and I'm a historian and copywriter. I love that. And also, how did the book come to be? Well, I've always had an interest in local history. I grew up in a family where uh, we did talk about current events at the dinner table every night. We did read the newspapers. We did watch the local news. We paid attention to what was going on. And I do have a background in journalism and also in local history. Uh, I've written for the Texas State Historical Association and written for the Handbook of Texas Online. I've got several entries. My latest on Bill Yeoman is going to be coming out in a couple of months. It's going through the process right now. And I've written about other Houstonians such as Ray Miller and the late Ron Stone. So uh, my background is in journalism and writing and uh, done a lot of history uh, such as I've described there. Wonderful, wonderful. Now. How did the book also, you mentioned, what, what makes the book special and unique? Because you've got some really important things in there that most people haven't seen. Well, when we started, when I started creating the book, we started looking at uh, sources and we found a lot of people who have uh, previously unpublished collections, private collections that have never really been seen. They've been in the family for generations, but they've never been exposed to the public. And the beauty of this is it really gives you a portrait of Spring Branch that we don't really think about nowadays. Most people who drive through Spring Branch, they drive up and down the Katy Freeway, they drive through the neighborhoods. They, don't rem they can't conceive of a time when Houston didn't have the cars and Houston didn't have the urbanization that we're so used to today. So when I started looking at these pictures of what Spring Branch was like back in the 1800s when the German settlers started coming here, it was really interesting to see. It was, a, it was really a different world, but it was the same area of town that we know today. So it's an interesting uh, story to share with the readers. And then give us some ideas about Spring Branch itself, the overall borders. You've got them up here listed, but kind of tell the audience there and the listeners at home what we're looking at border-wise. Well, when you talk about Spring Branch, number one, it is not incorporated. Uh, it's a general area of the city, and for general purposes, we say that the North, Northwest Freeway is the northern border the Sam Houston Tollway, the West Sam Houston Tollway is the western border. The Katy Freeway is the southern border. And then the 610 loop on the uh, section between the North Freeway and I-10 would be the eastern border. Now, that, that's a very general de uh, definition, Mr. McKinney. Yeah. But uh, as I say, it's not really, it never, was never incorporated. And the uh, school district itself that I write about in there, uh, extends further beyond that and there are people in town who will say that Spring Branch extends out towards Derry Ashford which is well beyond the Beltway. Uh, it includes the Memorial area which is south of I-10 and part of the Spring Branch School District is there. So in general terms, uh, Spring Branch includes all that area. And here's a map by the way so we can kind of get an idea of the Spring Branch area we're talking about, which is obviously the western side of Houston. Mm -hmm. So kind of check that out. And then let me give you an idea of the actual Spring Branch district. You know, so both those areas kind of gives people context. Mm -hmm. Well, what we have here is, like I said before, the, here's a 290 up here. And they, for the Spring Branch district, they have it here at the Hempstead Highway. 
and they go a little bit beyond the uh, West Belt to Britmore. But basically, it's the same area that we were describing a moment ago. You've got several different areas in the Spring Branch area that uh, we think of as Spring Branch nowadays. I should also point out that Spring Branch uh, has been around for quite some time. It's it was settled in the era, years before Houston itself became a city. And you had settlers right here in the 1820s and 1830s. And you think about it nowadays, people commute from Spring Branch to downtown Houston every day. It's a very popular area of town now because of its location. But back in those days, you imagine with no, ro no roads and no trails, you had to ride your horse, you had to walk from say where Gessner is today or where Voss is today and walk downtown and that's that's just a really long commute. You know and you cover a lot of that too how how the community was kind of spread out and real quick I want to do a shout out to of course Councilmember Amy Peck who's District A and you can look at the District A map and you can really see how the area that we're talking about really encompasses the majority of where the heart of Spring Branch is. So real quick shout out to Amy Peck, because she's wonderful. I can also talk about Amy. Um, I've given presentations such as this on Spring Branch to various civic groups and neighborhood associations in the area over the years. And Amy used to be the chief of staff to Brenda Stardig, who was her predecessor on the Houston City Council District A. So I had a chance to meet Amy on a couple of occasions uh, terrific lady and uh, wish her all the best at City Hall. Yeah, you know, she's great and she's a great ambassador for District A. More importantly, her passion and she's been really sharing this event. So bless you for that because getting the word out with the constituents about how great local history is because we know that if you know more about the city you grew up in, the area you grew up in, you're, you know, you're going to be uh, better uh, informed and of course more civically yeah. involved. One other story real quickly about Amy is when I started to market the book and started reaching out for speaking opportunities to promote the book, I got in touch with Brenda Sterling's office and I spoke to Amy and she was able to get me a list of all the neighborhood associations and you would take that for granted really with any city council member but they really do keep up with uh, the neighborhood associations they want to know who's who in the area so they can better serve the public and, and came time to speak about this book it really worked out very well. Well let's do it let's talk about early Spring Branch residents okay a famous resident right there tell us who this gentleman is. His name is Carl Colby and he was German he's one of the earliest settlers to the area and he had a little farm uh, in the Spring Branch area today and people don't recognize this but Spring Branch uh, really does exist in terms of what it was named for it's a creek. It's a well, creek and, that, and he's he's the reason why, right? That's correct. He had his farm out there, and he had the creek running through it. And one day, a, a visitor came to his farm and said, Carl, what do you call this place? What do you call this creek? And Colby said, I call it Spring Branch. And that's how the area gets its name. Now, Spring Branch today, it does, the creek runs through the area. And this picture I took just recently, they put a drainage ditch in, as you can see. And there's the other side. There's a walking bridge. It's more the natural side of it, yeah, too. Yeah, it's more the, more the natural side. That's right. But this uh, creek runs right by uh, Westview and Peck. And there's a small city park just north of there, or county park, excuse me. But this is where uh, Spring Branch is, and it does exist, and people drive over it every day. Now, uh, Frank Colby uh, is part of the Colby family, and as you can see from uh, their Ziggy Getup, I mean, this is an era long before what we know today with the air conditioning and the casual dress. You can only imagine how hot it must have been for them when they came here and they had settled in the area. Lumber was a very big deal here in this area. We were on the southern end of the Pine Forest and in those days we didn't have developers. We were the developers and uh, you came out there and you built your, cut down the trees, you put together the lumber and you built the houses as you see here. Now Christian Beinhorn was another German settler and his story ended rather tragically. He died of a spider bite in 1905. But Beinhorn Road, which is just south of I-10, runs through the heart of Spring Branch, was named in his honor. And then here, Conrad and Mary Helena uh, Sauer. Um, there was a Harris County commissioner by the name of E.A. Squatty Lyons. And he and Conrad Sauer were apparently very good friends back in their era. And Lyons apparently told Conrad Sauer, I want to name a street after you. Well, Lyons went and looked it up and found out there was a, a Sauer Street already. And the law said you can't have two streets named Sauer or two streets named have the same name. 
So we had to go back to Conrad and Mary Helena Sauer and said, we're going to rename the street. We're going to call it Conrad Sauer. And Conrad Sauer it sits east of the uh, West Belt and north of I-10 in the Spring Branch West area. Now, Arnold Hillendahl uh, was a farmer and a civic leader in our area. And this is a picture of him uh, obviously plowing the farm. Now, the Hillendahl farm was at the intersection of Long Point and Peck Road. It was on the southeast portion of that area. And I think later on in this presentation, we have some pictures of the Hillendahl family cemetery I'll tell you about. But I want to tell you a little bit about this picture. Uh, when I was writing the book, uh, I had an email from my publisher and they said, here's our situation. We need you to send us four or five pictures with, that are possible cover pictures. You need to send the pictures, the captions for each, and give us a recommendation as to which picture you want to use. Well, I was visiting with Arnold Hillendahl's daughter who supplied a lot of the pictures for the book. She, longtime resident, knows a lot of people. Couldn't have been nicer, one of my primary sources. And we're going through the pictures and I was telling her about this request from my publisher. And it was right at that moment we came across this picture. And it was a wonderful picture because it's a nice juxtaposition of the urbanization of Houston with the star furniture in the background and Mr. Hillendahl doing his thing with the, uh, with the farm. And I ended up sending the publisher several pictures and wrote them a note and said, here are the pictures, but I am telling you this is the one you want and why. And they came back and they agreed with it. As it turns out, when I've given speeches on the Spring Branch area, I tell the story and a lot of people come to me and they recognize that old star furniture and they're well aware of where uh, Peck and Long Point are. And it's even today, it's a very heavily traveled area of the Spring Branch area. And the uh, sub courthouse is there on Peck Road. So those are some of the stories they can tell you about that. Now, the Hillendahl family uh, was like a lot of other families that came to Spring Branch. They're German and German heritage. And these are the Hillendahl brothers and uh, there were five of them, as you see, and uh, Arnold Hillendahl was the one they named the library after on M. Nora, and we'll talk a little bit more about M. Nora in just a moment. Uh, Henry Hillendahl, when he died, decided he wanted to be buried on his farm. We can go to the next picture, I think we have it. And there at the intersection, you can see the street sign up there in the corner of Long Point and Peck is the Hillendahl Family Cemetery. And People drive up and down Long Point every day, right by that cemetery, and if you're and not looking, they have looking, no idea. They have no idea, and you don't see it if, unless you're looking for it. Uh, this picture was taken some years ago because we were there a couple of weeks ago to look at the cemetery, and there's a couple of trees there now. And if you're not, if you don't know what you're looking for, you're probably going to miss it. But it's right there, and Henry Hill and other uh, family members are buried there on the property. The uh, Cemetery was designated as a historic Texas cemetery. This is the program from that. And um, it just goes to show, I think, that uh, the people are starting to catch on to the, the fact that this has a real history here. And, and talk about this because they were also recognized uh, yes. by Mr. Landrum, Superintendent yes. Landrum. So talk about that. Well, uh, Mr. Hillendahl was recognized for his long service to the school district, and he received this letter along with a little yellow card. And the letter was signed by H.M. Landrum. He was the superintendent of the Spring Branch School District. And he was commended for his service to the district. And that little yellow card gave him free pass to any Spring Branch School District's event, whether it be a sports event or a play or a fine arts event or anything of the sort. And now we're back on the program again. But uh, the Hillendahl family has been very active in the community for some years. And... Uh, Ruth Hillendahl Plum saved that uh, letter, and then, as I said a moment ago, the library over on Emnora in Spring Branch West, it's on the next slide, was named in his honor. The library was open in the early 1970s, and in recent, more recent years, it had a major renovation. And that library is, uh, in fact, where one of the places I started doing the research for this book. Go ahead and change the slide. Elizabeth Ring. Uh, is the namesake of another library. This one is on Long Point, and it's not far from St. Peter Church. 
And Elizabeth Ring was one of the early librarians in Houston. She worked with Julia Ideson, whose name is on the main building. Yeah, uh, that's a big deal. So uh, Elizabeth Ring was very active and very supportive of the library, on the library staff and did a lot and say, named this library in her honor. Now, Talk about the villages, too. We got them right over here, but people are very confused kind of about how that whole west side of Houston works because you've got some incorporated cities and you've got some areas, you've got some management districts, you've got some tiers. Talk about that. Okay. And after the post-World post War II era, Houston's really grew. The economy boomed and everything expanded west, really in all directions, but west particularly. And it came out to the area where Spring Branch sits today. It's kind of hard to imagine back in those days, even after World War II, you could go to the Spring Branch area and it wasn't, it was part of the Houston area, but it wasn't in the city. Well, the city grew and the city looked at the land and you could see them all kind of drooling and you could see the developers looking at it. They're all kind of drooling. Well, there are folks in that area of town, the West area that thought they didn't want anything to do with it. They wanted their own communities. They wanted to incorporate themselves. They didn't want to be part of the Houston city, even though they're certainly part of the Houston community today. We have six villages, uh, the three H's, Hedwig Village, Hylshire Village, and Hunters Creek Village. And then the other three village, Bunker Hill Village, Piney Point, and Spring Valley. And, and uh, they, and so, so in the 1950s, what you have is you have Houston really kind of going on this annexation spree as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're seeing the growth and they're looking at the tax base grow out west and they're finding ways to say, well, we ought to incorporate those folks. And you had a lot of these independent municipalities bind together and say we're going to do our own thing and we're going to exactly try right. to kind of you know and that's what's so interesting about Houston's overall development history right there's no zoning in Houston so what do you do to stop a big city like Houston from from gobbling you up and mm -hmm. taking advantage of a, probably your tax base without offering the kind of services mm -hmm. that you know that you can do better yeah. so we see that happen in the 1950s post World War mm -hmm. um, and I really what I like to uh, two, two quick stories um, Hedwig Village you know the next picture because uh, you nice segue Hedwig Schrader, the Schrader family was among the early settlers of Spring Branch, and Hedwig, uh, they named the village in her honor, and uh, there's a park uh, near there, Hedwig Park, which is there. Also, going back to the Hillendahl family for a moment, uh, the Hillendahl family realized what was getting ready to happen with the annexation, and so when they had that cemetery built, they had it fenced off, and they made sure that that would not be annexed, so that... That, you know, there was not going to be any developer or any city person coming and saying, well, I think I'm going to dig this up and turn it into a strip mall. Now, there are strip malls nearby. Sure, sure. But that cemetery is still there. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, talk about some early religion, too, in the area as well, because it's a big deal when you have a community that comes in there. They, they bring everything. They bring their food, they bring their culture, and they bring their religion. So talk yeah. about some early churches. Well, the St. Peter Church is one of the earliest churches, possibly the earliest church in the Spring Branch area. It still exists at the intersection of Campbell and Long Point. Uh, this is the original uh, building. It's still there. It now has a historical marker in front of it. Uh, in more recent years, they have rented out the big sanctuary, which is right next door to it for other churches because of the, you know, the congregation can use it and so forth. Uh, but it's a wonderful little church and uh, it's still used today. Here is an early class. I believe this is from 1907. And a couple of the Pioneer families are represented in this picture. But before, in the days before the Spring Branch Independent School District came along, you had the churches uh, involved with the education and so the origins of the Spring Branch School District really came about in this area and it just kind of evolved into what we know today and of course it's a fun photo here tell people about uh, what they're doing here and then what ends up being on this property uh, later on well what happens here is you have a barbecue and in those days I mean think about the era you had no TV you had no cell phones you had no air conditioning you didn't have cars uh, to get together and have a good time everybody had festivals, they called them shoots and fests. And basically what that was, was they had these big uh, get togethers, they would cook the meat, they would all, all the families would show up, they'd have games, and they'd have shooting contests. And uh, it was a wonderful opportunity for families to get out and know each other. And as I said, this is in a much different era than what we know today. Uh, everything was outside. I mean, nowadays with the humidity, we. You, you're going to have a party, have it inside, have the AC. Oh, the sure. Bus, but you wouldn't do that back in those days. They didn't have that. But they were great fun, and they were very memorable. Now, St. Peter Church has behind it a cemetery, and it's a historic cemetery, and a lot of the early settlers of Spring Branch are buried there. 
And in those days, the big scourge, health scourge at the time, was yellow fever. And there was a yellow fever uh, epidemic that happened, I, I believe it was 1859 in this particular case. But the Reverend Hailfinger and a whole bunch of other victims died of the yellow fever. It was, uh, they had a mass grave for those folks. Wow. Kind of thing. I even have some autos buried in that particular And cemetery. let people know, and again, the great, the cemetery is where again? Just directly? It is directly behind the church. There's a big sanctuary there, and uh, that's where the cemetery is, and it's still in use today. In fact, there's a county historical marker there that they put there in recent years. St. Mark's Lutheran Church is another uh, historic church, and it's been around for some years. And a funny story about this picture, Mr. McKinney, uh, when I started looking at the pictures, there were signs that said St. Mark's, and then I'd look at it, uh, look it up on the internet and said St. Mark. Mm. And so we went out there, and I said, and they got someone to help us, and I said, okay, I need to see the cornerstone. Why do you need to see the cornerstone? Because I've seen St. Mark's, and I've seen St. Mark. And I want to make sure we get the name right. And the uh, sign says St. Mark's, but the, with the S, but St. Mark is the name on the church. And wow. It's still, and it, and it's, it's, uh, very, it's still very much at use today. So see, you've heard it here, by the way. You heard it here, folks. So if you're ever worried about that or confused, well, there you go. Get the book because it explains in detail, and you heard it from the author himself. Uh, talk about lumber, as you mentioned earlier, but talk about this character over here. Well, Bauer Lumber was one of the early uh, lumber companies in the area. And uh, as you can see with his uh, sophisticated hot rod with the crankshaft in the front, you know, that's how you had to uh, get, him started. You, get him started. But in those days, uh, Spring Branch was on the southern end of the, or like Houston itself was on the southern end of the forest. So you had the lumber, so you could cut down the trees and build the houses and build the businesses and shops. And so lumber was a very big deal in the early days of Spring Branch. And look at the license plate, by the way. Yeah, try and get that registered today at, at the DPS. <laughs> Four numbers. How about that? Yeah, and this is a picture of uh, some of the workers back in those days. And and you mentioned a, it earlier, but tell, tell us not only where the park was, but what is there today on that property? Well, there is a shooting range on that area today. It's Which is a, kind of ironic. Yes, but uh, it was a big deal, like I said, in those days. Everyone would... It was a big community event, and everybody would gather, and it was just a family fun. Of course, not everybody would go out and shoot, but everyone would go out and play games and eat and visit and socialize. So you've got these new municipalities. They need certain things, and you mm -hmm. probably did through your research. I know I know it's, it's a little bit different because we're talking about south of I-10 in some of these respects as well, but mm -hmm. some of these communities have to have police, and they have to have fire, and this is a really cool photo of a volunteer fire department. Yes, and uh, volunteer fire departments... Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting now because uh, it's, it's one of the stories of how the communities evolved from volunteer fire departments to having full-time professional firefighters. And it's something that I'm, I've been spending a lot of time reading about that lately and talking to people about that kind of evolution. But it's really interesting when you see what it was like in those days versus what you have today and the kind of training you have to have today to be a professional firefighter versus in those days if fire there's a fire you went and put out the fire and you didn't have all the equipment that you have today it's and then, really sophisticated you know it's interesting but you're right it was like more of a community volunteer base now talk about early education because there's some pioneers in education there's also mm -hmm. some folks that really have dedicated their lives to education in the area talk about mr landrum mr landrum was the principal at addicts high school and in those days, believe it or not, Attics was considered part of Spring Branch. I and mean, we for, think for context, let people know where the Attics community was located. If you know where Highway 6 meets I-10, uh, right there at the Energy Corridor, and a lot of Spring Branches today in the Energy Corridor, particularly you see the buildings going up near the Memorial City Mall. Yeah, the Energy Corridor, yeah, the, the, yeah. the Park 10 and things like that. Now, yeah. but what's interesting is that community, the community of Attics and Barker, way out on basically I-10 and Highway 6. If you look at the map earlier, the uh, the map we saw a second ago doesn't mm -hmm. go, it, it barely goes outside of Beltway 8 when it comes That's to right. the Spring Branch. You're talking about way out there, significant. Way out there. And H.M. Uh, Landrum was the principal, and uh, he went on to become the superintendent of the Spring Branch Independent School District, and he signed that letter that we showed you earlier. But he was also the namesake of uh, Landrum Middle School, which is on the eastern part of Spring Branch. But he was very active in getting the Spring Branch. And I, I think there's a school in Spring Branch. You want to make sure out there, there's a school that's being redone right now, right? That I think it's, it's in jeopardy of tearing down the original portion of the old 
post World War II architecture for the school. Are you know which one I'm talking about they by look, chance? Are you talking about Spring Branch High School? I, no, it's I, I think it might be a second, a middle school though, maybe, but or junior high, but mm. maybe it is that school. But nevertheless, there is you know with all this growth and probably the bond packages, what they're doing is they're tearing down some of these older schools, and we'd love to see them keep as much of that architectural history as possible, even if it is, you know, modern or post-World War II, the idea is it's a part of the footprint of the community. Well, I'll tell you a story. Tell um, us. I went to Springwoods High School, and it's part of a three-school complex in that area, and the elementary school was Westwood Elementary School. Ah. And what they ended up doing after they passed the bond issue a few years back was they built a new Westwood Elementary School over there, just, just to the west of that. So it's off by itself, and they turned the old Westwood Elementary School into a satellite campus for the other elementary schools that they're trying to rebuild and renovate. So if you go, went to, say, Shadow Oaks, you'd end up going to the old Westwood campus and while well, they re redid Shadow Oaks and so forth. They've been doing that for the past few years. And I love this because, like I said, your, your, your talk, your lecture, your books really take us back to an early time in Spring Branch history. And we might not think about a bus from the 1920s or 30s as historic, but it really was the way that people got out and about in this rural area, I mean, you're talking about Spring Branch spread out all throughout. We showed you the map earlier. Yeah, and this, this that was called District 27 for a period, and this is one of those pictures. And uh, you can see the bus driver, and I mean, it's amazing. I mean, how, how, how this has evolved, and yet how it's still somewhat the same. You put the kids on there, you get them to school. There you go. And speaking of students, here we have some. Mm -hmm. This is a later picture, and you can see you know, the school dress was a little bit different than that we're used to today. Now, uh, a lot of people know who Daryl Tully is, or they know the name because they've been to games at Daryl Tully Stadium. They've watched Spring Branch, or Westchester, or Springwoods, or Northbrook, or Memorial, or Stratford play there. And Daryl Tully was an important figure in the history of Spring Branch. And when I decided to write the book, one of the goals I had was to introduce readers to the person behind the name. You know the name, but do you know the person? And in the case of Coach Daryl Tully, he's on the left here. And he was the longtime Spring Branch High School football coach, and he was also the athletic director for the school district. And they named the stadium in his honor uh, in the 70s when the stadium was built. And one other person I would point out to you here, the fellow with the glasses in the back, his name is W.W. for Woodrow Wilson Emmons. And today the natatorium on the Tiger Trail is named in his honor, but W.W. Emmons was the first principal at Springwoods High School. And Daryl Tully had an interesting story. He was once a professional football player for the Detroit Lions. He played his college ball at what is today Texas A&M Commerce. And he played a year in Detroit. And uh, he came back to Texas and he got into coaching and uh, the rest is history. Now, behind what used to be Spring Branch High School is another stadium where Spring Branch played for many years. And they still use it today for soccer and the sub varsity football games. It's called Reggie Grobe Stadium. And Reggie Grobe played football at Spring Branch High School. He went on to play at the University of Texas, and he died tragically of uh, complications from a heat stroke in the 1960s. So they renamed wow. the honor, the stadium, in his honor. And uh, not, you know, this again goes back to what I was saying before about you know the name, but do you know the person? The story behind it. Yeah. I love that. Okay, how about uh, Don Coleman? Don Coleman went to college at Beaumont at Lamar, and he was into basketball, and he was the longtime basketball coach at Memorial High School. He led the Mustangs to a state championship back in the 1960s. And today, when uh, Spring Branch schools play their basketball games, they usually play at the Don Coleman Community Coliseum. They hold the graduations there. They hold sports banquets there. I've attended my share of those. Uh, but he's the man for whom the, the, school, the Coliseum is named. I love that. Okay, here we go. Now, talk about uh, some of the street. First off, look at the branding by the Spring Branch District. I think that's yes. wonderful because you mentioned that too and the importance of kind of having an identity for the area, and that is really thanks to uh, this organization that's mm -hmm. come together. They have, and they've, they're trying to promote the Pride and Spring Branch, and it's really neat to, neat to see that because you see it around town with the Upper Kirby District and other areas of town. So it's really neat to see Spring Branch doing this. This has been going on for some years now. Uh, and Nora is on, uh, intersects with Gessner, and it's in Northwest Spring Branch, north of Springwoods High School. And, and Nora is named for Emma Beinhorn and uh, Lenora Beinhorn, and their father owned the property on which 
the uh, Hillendale Library is built. And I thought when I took that picture, it was a nice way of bringing everything full circle because for all the development that we have in Spring Branch and for all the urbanization, you see a lot of the names that are still you know, of the tradition of the people who created the area and who originally settled here, the Colbys and the Schraders and the Beinhorns and so forth. Well, now um, we are not going to have questions and comments because we're getting close out of time. But I want to put George Slaughter's uh, website on the on the uh, screen over here, georgeslaughter.com. There it is, georgeslaughter.com. Will will get you connected to all the great things that he's doing over throughout the time. Also, a way to get a hold of him. So it's all right there now, uh, George. Let's definitely ask those questions. We have some really good questions for y'all. So George, you get to ask five questions for the audience out there. And of course, uh, we want to let people know. So let's know what those questions are. Let's okay. first ask the first one. What is the first question you have for the guests out there? Well, the first question I'd ask is, um, uh, the name Spring Branch came from what German farmer? Ah, so once again, the question is, what German farmer is credited for naming the area Spring Branch? It was in the very beginning of George's presentation. What is the name? We'll accept the first name, last name, or a combination of. So because, uh, so what you'll do is you'll chime in the comments, by the way. We're going to air the video. The first person to chime in the comments, the ones that get it right. How about our next question? Uh, I mentioned that there were uh, six high schools in the Spring Branch area. I named them all. And two of which have since been closed uh, in the 1980s because the district was uh, consolidating. One of them was Spring Branch High School. But another one uh, was also closed at that time. And I'll give a hint. And it's in the book. Uh, that high school's drill team performed at Super Bowl Eight at Rice Stadium, which was the first Super Bowl played in Houston. We've had three of them here. 1974, you're right. Uh, but uh, there's a picture of this particular drill team doing its thing at halftime of the Super Bowl, and that's one of the two school high schools that have since been closed. That's now an international center. That's another hint. So once again, the question is, uh, say it one more time for the audience out there. Uh, the, there are six, at one time, Spring Branch had six high schools, and four of them exist today. Two were closed. One of those that was closed was Spring Branch. And what is the other one? Okay, how about our uh, third question? Third question is Daryl Tully, before he became a football coach, was a professional football player. He played one season for what team? Okay, so Daryl Tully played professional football for what NFL team? Okay, that's a big deal. Daryl Tully, Daryl Tully Stadium. Okay, how about our fourth question? Well, you've got that on front of your notes there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well we, we mentioned street names earlier, so yes. give us that question about a street name. Yes. Um, M. Nora comes from, are named after what people? There you go. What two people make up the name of M. Nora Street, okay? Mention the first Lane, name. Yeah, right. yeah, M. Nora Lane, correct. Right. Mention the name, okay? He said it earlier, one of the last questions he had. Now, the final question, talk about it. It was a big festival. What is the Shoots and Fest? Okay, I might have given that one away, okay, because I prompted you weird. I apologize, but look, how about one? So we're not going to ask that question because, well, first off, give them that answer, and we'll do a sixth question omitting that last question. Okay, well, Shoots and Fest is a shooting festival, but it also had other things going on, such as what? I mean, you, you go out and you shoot guns, yes, but the, what else did they You mean we showed it? a photo of it earlier? Yes, Okay. A photo in there. So here's the question. We showed a photo earlier of what happens over at Shootin' Fest. What was the photo of people doing and or it's a very famous Texas pastime, so we should all know this, right, yeah. if we're listening in. Okay, we're not going to give it away because <laughs> you're going to chime in in the comments section with the answer to these questions, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's see what else we got over here. Well, once again, thank you again to George Slaughter for sharing his awesome history about Spring Branch. Lastly, I want to make sure a big thank you to you because we appreciate you tuning in. And thank you to our team, Alana, Isaac, Ted, Kean. Uh, and then, of course, thank you to Allison Ayers Bell, who was our executive director, and Manette Basil, who you met earlier, our board president. Okay? Good night. Have a great evening. Once again, thank you for joining us. No show on September 16th. But we'll be right back in our studio on the 23rd of September with Christopher Varela talking about early radio Houston history. There it is, Christopher Varela. Do not miss out, by the way. Thank you again, George Slaughter, well, for joining you. us. We appreciate your time. Good night, guys. Take care. Yes.